Hi, my name is Sergey Levin, and today I'm going to talk about ensuring safety in online reinforcement learning by leveraging offline data. So reinforcement learning can be used to acquire robotic skills in a wide range of settings, including safety critical settings like driving a uh, robot down a sidewalk, driving an autonomous car, controlling a legged robot that has to run, jump, and turn, and even controlling quad rotors. So these are safety critical settings where we need to process raw perception, output low-level control, but also avoid catastrophic failures. In principle, a very well-trained reinforcement learning policy can be very good at this. However, to get there, we often need to go through a little bit of trouble. As an example, consider this uh, walking robot. After 2,000 iterations, in this case of a TRPO, we can get the walking robot to run more or less continuously on an infinitely long uh, flat plane. However, during the training process, it has to do a bunch of things like this. So if this was a real world physical system, by the time it gets to the 2000th iteration, it would have probably long ago broken itself or damaged something. So this is a really big problem if we want to get reinforced learning systems that actually work in the real world. Now, when we think about safety and generalization of learning based uh, systems, in the world of supervised learning, the picture in some ways is a little bit easier. So in supervised learning, we know that uh, we can get unpredictable results on out of distribution inputs. So if we train an image classifier in one domain and then we test it in another domain, anything could happen. But if we limit the amount of distributional shift, basically if we know that the test domain resembles the training domain somehow, then we can generally get reliable uh, predictions. So the safety challenge for supervised learning systems is far from solved, but it's not nearly as bad as it is in reinforcement learning. With reinforcement learning, the trouble is that we might require potentially unsafe exploration if we start from scratch. And if we try to incorporate prior data, that inevitably induces distributional shift. Because if we're doing reinforcement learning, the whole point is to get a policy that is better than what we saw before. And being better means inducing distributional shift. So the main idea that I'm going to explore in this talk is how we can reduce the risks in RL to be more like the familiar indistributional statistical generalization risks. And if we can do that, then we might be much closer to getting RL methods that are actually viable for use in the real world, including in safety critical systems. So uh, before we get to that question, we have to, of course, uh, ask, how can we develop data-driven RL methods in the first place? If we're going to be talking about distributional shift between training data and test data, well, we need to be able to use training data. So classically, when we think about reinforcement learning, we think about on-policy RL, where you have a policy that interacts with the world, collects a little bit of data, and it uses that little bit of data to improve itself, and then it throws out the data and collects some more. If we want to use prior data, then we have to start looking at offline reinforcement learning. So offline reinforcement learning deals with a problem setting where you are given a data set that was collected by some other policy, which we call pi beta, and you have to use that data set to recover the best policy you can get, and then you can deploy it and get a result. Of course, in reality, you might want to then do some additional on-policy training to improve the policy further, but it's the offline phase that often presents the biggest challenge. So if you want to imagine how this would look like in a practical robotic system, your robot might have a large data set of experience from all of its past interactions, basically all the things that it's done, where it understands whether those things are safe or not. And it can use that with offline training to train up the best policy it can get, uh, and then deploy it to occasionally get a little bit more data to fine tune a particular new skill. And of course, this is very useful if you want to get robotic systems, but it can also be used in other safety critical set settings. Like you could imagine, for instance, you would never want to learn to prescribe medication through on policy exploration, but learning to prescribe medication more optimally by leveraging prior data is not outside the realm of possibility. All right, so can offline training uh, set the stage for safe online learning? So we're going to take a bunch of prior data and we're going to use that data to train something, and that something is going to serve to facilitate efficient and hopefully safe online adaptation. So we're going to train with offline RL, but the goal is not just to solve the task entirely with offline training. The goal is going to be to provide initialization for safely fine tuning uh, to some task. And this can be a, a task agnostic pre-training, basically use offline data to learn to safely explore for any task, or it can be task specific, use offline training to pre-train to explore efficiently for a particular task that you want. And then you'll do some online adaptation with on-policy RL. So you want to be able to adapt online and explore for the new task while using pre-trained policies and models to provide some measure of safety, some sort of constraint that keeps you from doing, getting those catastrophic failures.
Uh, and conceivably, this whatever you learn from this offline data could provide a constraint for a standard online method. So the online method could be something specialized to your approach, or it could even be just like some standard method that is uh, that receives a constraint from your offline learned model. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two methods in this talk. The first, uh, which is called Lyapunov density models, is going to provide for task agnostic offline free training, and the second one is going to focus on task-specific Bayesian pre-training. So the first one will learn a model that provides a constraint for any downstream task, and the second one will be task-specific. Okay, so let's uh, try to make this notion of a safety constraint from offline data a little more precise. So we're going to be we're going to assume that we're given some prior data, and that prior data could come from a variety of sources. It could come from uh, some hand-designed policies. So maybe you have some not very performant but safe policy that you use to collect data. It could come from some previous controller you already have. It could even come from humans controlling the robot, like, you know, that's a very practical thing in autonomous driving, for instance. It could even come from random data collection. So if for whatever reason you could get your hands on some high, high coverage random data, that's fine too, you can use that also. There's no assumption that the prior data only shows safe behaviors, uh, although typically it would because, you know, you pro it's probably very hard to collect lots of data on car crashes, for example. So we're not assuming the prior data shows catastrophic failures. We don't need it to show catastrophic failures, but we also don't assume that it does not contain that. And then we're going to use that prior data to learn some kind of uh, model. Uh, so in a, in a standard learning-based control approach, we're going to ask, well, if we learn this model on some data, is the model going to be correct when we use it to control the robot at test time? And of course, the challenge with this question is when we use the model to control the robot at test time, the robot will enter new states that might not have been seen in the prior data. And at that point, the learned model might not be correct in those new states anymore. Uh, so generally, the way that we would think about this based on kind of rudimentary learning theory, uh, well, if we learn some kind of model, like a dynamics model or a value function, we're training it on data using essentially empirical risk minimization. So we want to minimize the expected value of the error under the data distribution. But in practice, of course, we have samples from the data distribution, so we minimize the error on those samples. And then we could say, well, if our inputs x came from some distribution p of x, given some new test x, x star, is the value of our learned function at x star going to be correct? Well, the only thing that we really know is the expected value of the error is low under the data distribution. Uh, in, and in general, the expected error is not low under any other distribution that is not equal to the data distribution. So, what this suggests to us is that if we want the learned model to be more likely to be correct, we should somehow stay close to the data distribution. So learned models can make mistakes when there's too much distributional shift. So if you want your learned model not to make mistakes, use that prior data to get something that will prevent that distribution shift at test time. So can we learn constraints from prior data that prevent distributional shift? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to learn a safety constraint, which I'm going to call a function g of s comma a. So s is a state, a is an action. And you're learning some function that looks at a state, looks at an action, and is basically going to output some number. And as long as you threshold on that number, then you will ensure that you remain safe. Now, the word safe here is going to have a very particular meaning, which is maybe a little bit unconventional. So safe doesn't mean that you're always going to avoid catastrophe. Safe means that you're going to stay in distribution. And the assumption that we're making here is that if you stay in distribution, then whatever controller you learn from that prior data will know what it's doing. So basically, it's not the job of this G function to actually prevent the robot from falling, for example. The job of the G function is to prevent the robot from going into a state where a learned model wouldn't know what to do. So you assume that in distribution, the learned model will already know how to avoid falling. So you don't need a safety constraint to take care of that. And then you'll use this for some downstream task. And that downstream task involves interacting with the world where you will only permit an action if the g value for that action is less than or equal to some threshold delta. So again, the slightly unconventional notion of safety here is that being safe means being in distribution, which is not necessarily the conventional definition. It's like, oh, safe means that you don't fall or you don't crash. No, safe means you stay in distribution. And the assumption is that if you stay in distribution, then your learned controller will avoid crashing. Now, there's a little detail here that I do want to point out, which is staying in distribution in general doesn't actually guarantee that you don't crash. So the assumption is basically that if the probability of a seen state is above some threshold, then your model knows what to do. In general, it actually might not. So there's, there's actually a little bit of a mismatch. It's, it's reasonable to assume that it will, and in practice it usually does. But um, it's, the assumptions needed to make that actually work out are actually fairly delicate. So for more on that, I would encourage you to check out the paper. But for now, we'll just make you know, the fairly natural assumption 
that if you stay in distribution, meaning the probability of your state in action under the data distribution is not too low, then any learned model or, or policy will know what to do. Okay, so what does this constraint need to uh, provide us? Well, we're going to use the constraint in the following way. We're going to only, only allow an action at if this function g says that its value is less than or equal to delta. And what we want is if we follow this constraint, then for all future time steps t prime uh, that are greater than or equal to t, the log probability of st prime at prime is going to be greater than or equal to epsilon. So this is what we need. We, we need the, this constraint to satisfy the property that if we always only allow actions with a value less than or equal to delta, then we will never encounter state action tuples in the future with a log probability less than epsilon. Uh, and as I said before, this hinges on the assumption that we're less likely to make mistakes in high probability states. Okay, so now an obvious question you might ask is, well, if this is all you want, is it enough to just allow actions whose density is greater than or equal to epsilon? Basically, we want to ensure that the log probability is greater than or equal to epsilon for all steps in the future. Is it enough to just do this greedily? Basically, if you never permit an action with a probability less than or equal to epsilon, will you ever encounter states with probability less than or equal to epsilon? Well, the answer is unfortunately yes. So there are ways that you can construct your data set so that even though you only ever permit high probability actions, you will eventually encounter low probability states. And this doesn't actually require the dynamics to be stochastic. Um, it just requires the data set to be distributed in a particular way. So in this example, in the top branch, in the data set, from every state there are two possible actions that were taken in the data. So you could imagine that there are many trajectories, and for the top branch, uh, if you went up, then half the time the data had, had you continue to go up, and half the time it went down. So what that means is that the probability mass is divided by two at every branch uh, for, the, for the top subtree. In the bottom subtree, it's not. In the, in the bottom subtree, there's always exactly one action available. So what that means is that in the top, in the top subtree, if you, only, if you always greedily choose the action to have a log probability greater than or equal to epsilon, you will eventually hit states with arbitrarily low probability. So in order to avoid this issue, this model needs to have enough look ahead. It needs to understand that for that top branch, eventually all the states get low probability. But for the bottom branch, you'll stay, you, the probability will remain high. So that means that even though at the very first time step, the top branch and the bottom branch have equal probability, Later on, the top branch will get less likely. So if you have enough look ahead, you'll know that you shouldn't go there. So you really need to consider long-term consequences to ensure that you'll stay in distribution. So one mathematical tool that we can use to instantiate this is a connection to something called Lyapunov stability. Now, Lyapunov stability, a priori, doesn't really have anything to do with uh, distributions or distributional shift. Uh, it's a much more geometric notion in optimal control. So stability means that if you start at a state x with a norm less than delta and the dynamical system is stable, then for all future time steps, the norm of x will be less than epsilon. Now, you could also imagine that epsilon and delta are equal, then maybe it's easier to understand. So if you start within some ball with a particular radius, you'll stay inside that ball. Uh, the more general definition says that if you start within one ball delta, you might stay within some other potentially larger ball epsilon. But if that's a little hard to understand, you can just imagine that these are equal. So this is a picture that illustrates this. So if you start within the circle of radius delta, stability means you will never leave some other circle of radius epsilon, and epsilon might be equal to delta. Okay, so that's stability. And if you have a dynamical system that is stable, then we know that we can construct something called the Lyapunov function, which is a scalar valued function. Uh, which uh, satisfies certain properties. Uh, I won't go through them formally, but informally, uh, the derivative uh, of V induces a potential field that de decreases along the dynamics. So uh, essentially, if you have this kind of stability property, you can construct some sort of energy function where the point in the middle is the point of minimum uh, energy and the energy function is uh, uh, going to satisfy essentially convexity properties inside that ball. Now this is for an uncontrolled system. You can also construct a control up on a function V of X and the control function uh, basically induces a stable system if your control u is chosen such that the dot product of the dynamics f of x comma u with the gradient of the Lyapunov function of the control Lyapunov function is negative. So that basically says if you get to control the system, all you need is for there to, to exist some action that you can always take that will decrease uh, the value of the Lyapunov function. 
And that's that's enough to ensure that there exists actions that will provide for a stable system. There might exist other actions that don't, but uh, this just guarantees that you will you can find actions that will keep you inside that ball epsilon. Okay, now, of course, our goal is not to stay within a particular geometric region. Or no, our goal is not to stay within a ball. Our goal is to stay in states that have a high probability. Uh, but there are a few things we can observe here. So the Lyapunov function looks a lot like a value function RL. And in fact, this connection can be made precise. So if we discretize time, uh, it turns out that the Lyapunov function actually is very much like a, a value function. So the key idea we're going to use in this work is that instead of using the Lyapunov formalism to stabilize, stabilize around x equals zero, we're going to use it to stabilize in regions with high density. So those are not necessarily a point in space, and it's not necessarily going to be a ball. It's going to be some funny shaped region, but we're going to essentially stabilize around high probability states. So what that means is that just like with uh, Lyapunov stability, for all future states, you have a guarantee that x of t uh, is less than epsilon, here, you're going to guarantee that for all future time steps, log p of st prime, at prime, is going to be greater than or equal to epsilon. So here's the, the intuition for how we can train this g uh, to satisfy this property. So g is essentially going to be the analog of a Lyapunov function. Uh, we call it the Lyapunov density model. And the reason we call it a Lyapunov density model, of course, is that it has some properties of a Lyapunov function and some properties of a density model. In fact, you can actually show that for particular special dynamical systems, the Lyapunov density model is a density model, and under special conditions, the Lyapunov density model is also a Lyapunov function, although in general, it generalizes both of those notions. So the intuition is that we're going to make it kind of similar to the negative log probability, basically the energy, but we're going to make it Lyapunov consistent, which means that it's not just the energy of a state action tuple now, it's actually the minimum energy uh, of the state action tuples you might encounter in the future. And that will guarantee that the log probabilities always stay above epsilon, which is like kind of like the Lyapunov function guarantee that the norm of the state is going to be less than epsilon. So the Lyapunov density model is some function g of st at, uh, where if you always pick your action at such that g of st at is less than or equal to delta, then for all future time steps t prime greater than or equal to t, you are guaranteed that log p st prime at prime is greater than or equal to epsilon. That's basically the definition. Now, there are some important questions we could ask about these LDMs. One is, can we learn LDMs from offline data? That's not at all a given, right? So it's easy to show that an LDM exists. It's comparatively hard to actually learn it from offline data, especially from sample data. Can we guarantee that using LDMs as constraints guarantees bounded distributional shift? Like in practice, if we actually have sampling error and we actually use this LDM as a constraint, are we guaranteed to never go into states with probability that's too low? And can we use LDMs in conjunction with downstream methods like model-based RL, for example? So if we use it to constrain planning with a learned model, will we actually satisfy this constraint? And it turns out the answer to all these questions is yes. So if we use LDMs from offline data, it actually turns out to look a lot like offline RL, and we can borrow algorithmic concepts from standard offline reinforcement learning to instantiate this. We can get guarantees, and they can even account for sampling error. And we can actually show that if we use an LDM in conjunction with model-based RL, it actually leads to a reduction in catastrophic failure rates. All right. So let's talk about learning LDMs. So here I've just formalized the definition of the LDM from before. So basically the LDM is equal to the minimum over all the actions of the maximum over all future time steps of the negative log probability. Negative log probability is basically the energy. You can express this recursively, right? Notice that there's an, a max over future time steps. So you can take that max and you can express it as the max between the current time step and the LDM at the next time step. So expressing it recursively, the LDM of STAT is just the max of the negative log probability now and the minimum LDM at the next time step. And that starts to look a lot like the Bellman equation. And in fact, you can actually learn these Lyapunov density models with a modified Bellman equation. In a regular Bellman equation, you add the reward to the next value, and here you're going to take a max of the two. So just like we minimize Bellman error when we do Q learning, here we're going to minimize the, differ the squared difference. There's a missing square on the slide. The difference between G of SA and the max of the negative log probability now and the minimum LDM value later. So the LDM training process is step one, train a density model. So you can use, for example, an EBM to do this. Um, or any other density estimation method that you prefer. Uh, 
And step two, train this G by using any offline RL method with this modified Delman backup at the, at the bottom. So in our prototype, we're actually going to use the conservative Q-learning method, or CQL, which also provides some appealing guarantees to avoid overestimation, which is kind of helpful. Okay, so now let's talk about using LDMs for downstream tasks. So when you learn an LDM with offline RL, essentially what do you get? You get a neural network that takes in a SA and outputs a real number. Now you can also use that same data to train a dynamics model. Let's call it F, and the dynamics model takes in a state in action and outputs the next state. So we have prior data, we're going to use it to learn our safety constraint, our LDM, and we're going to also use it to learn our model, our dynamics model. And then we'll use these together to solve some downstream task where we'll only allow actions that pass the LDM constraint. And we'll interact with the world using only those actions. So the particular method that we're going to use here in our experiments is a model predictive control method, although any RL method could actually be used, or even any annotation learning method. We're, we're going to go with model predictive control because it's simple, basically because it only implicates the model. There's no additional policy or value function. So we're going to plan a sequence of actions that maximize the reward, subject to the constraint that the future states are given by our model. And we're only going to permit those actions that pass the LDM constraint. So negative log C is basically the constraint. And the reason I'm expressing it as negative log C is because then the probability is greater than C. And we're going to compare this approach to a baseline where instead of using the LDM as a constraint, we're just going to naively use a density model as a constraint. So that's that greedy thing where you only permit actions that are high probability now, but you don't care about their future consequences. So that's kind of the thing we're going to compare to. Now, again, this is not the only way to use LDMs, but it does provide us with a reasonable default starting point that we can analyze. Okay, so first let's talk about the baseline. Theoretically, it's quite easy to construct counterexamples where the baseline is arbitrarily bad. Arbitrarily bad meaning that the actual reward or the actual density that you get uh, is arbitrarily low. And the way to construct these is basically that uh, branching example that I showed before, where you have two branches. On one of the branches, the probability density is conserved every step. On the other branch, it's divided by two each time because you have two options in the uh, data distribution, two, two, two available actions to you. This doesn't mean that the MDP has only two actions, it just means that in the data, you see those two actions. So in this case, the regular density model at the first time step is just as likely to permit the top branch as it is to permit the bottom branch, and the top branch inevitably leads to failure because in the top branch, the density always decreases as you go. For the LDM approach, we can actually construct a theoretical guarantee that accounts for sampling error for training the LDM and also uh, sampling error in the model. So this is the form of that guarantee, and I'm going to unpack it for you. So, of course, if you train the LDM exactly, meaning that you actually get a perfect LDM, then you're guaranteed that future log probabilities are greater than or equal to log C. But in general, you're going to have errors, and those errors basically come from two places. One place uh, is that your density model might be incorrect, and the other place is that when you train the LDM with those Bellman backups, those Bellman backups themselves might incur error. So that means that your bound is going to be actually a little bit worse than log C, which means in practice you need to increase C a little bit so that you actually clear the, the bound that you really want. So let, let's uh, describe what those sources of error are. Epsilon P, that's easy. That's just the error in fitting the density model. So we're going to assume that we can fit the density model with a bounded uh, error in the infinity norm. Now, bounded error in infinity norm is a somewhat strong assumption, but it's a density model, so maybe that's not entirely unreasonable. Um, and then the other term, which is a little more complex, uh, let me just define what those uh, what those components there mean. So R, you can basically think of it as recoverability. So if R is very uh, low, that means it's easy to recover from low density regions back to high density regions. So it's, it's almost like a measure of how reversible things are. If you figure out that you've made a mistake, can you go back? K is the full task horizon. So it might be some large number, or it might be like 1 over 1 minus gamma. Epsilon LS is the TD error per iteration. So basically, this is how much error you incur when you minimize that squared Bellman-like Bellman uh, error in fitting the LDM at each iteration uh, of LDM training. And then epsilon uh, fin, uh, this is basically the error in fitting the density model the last time stuff. So this is basically the same as the error in the density model, but uh, we can kind of special case the last time stuff part. So 
Now, from looking at this uh, inequality, you can see that, of course, if we have a low error in our density model, so epsilon fin and epsilon p is low, and we have a low error in fitting the LDM at each iteration of TD, so epsilon less is low, then we would expect the bound to be pretty good. Okay, so that's the theoretical result. Now let's look at the empirical result. So the way that we're going to compare the performance of LDMs uh, is the following. We're going to look at different threshold values and we're, we're actually going to pick the threshold values by using percentiles of the data, just so that they're not magic numbers. They're going to be between 0 and 100. And that is saying we're going to pick delta based on the log probability of that percentile of the data set. So that just gives us a scale that makes sense. And for each threshold, we're going to look at the average reward on the task and the failure rate. Now, these are two different things. So in this case, we're looking at the hopper. And failure means that the hopper fell. Reward means the hopper reached the destination. So this is a goal-directed hopper. Its goal is to jump to a particular location. And the data consists of the hopper jumping to different places in the world and also potentially falling sometimes. So the data is not free of failures. Um, and we're comparing four different methods here. The blue is the LDM constraint. That's our approach. The orange is when we use the density model as a constraint. So that's the greedy constraint. The green is when we use an ensemble of models. And the red is when there's no constraint at all. And that just basically fails all the time. So if we have a uh, extremely low threshold, um, and low, low threshold here means that we permit um, even extremely low probabilities. So this is a minimal constraint. Uh, then typically, we're going to get failure. Typically, the, the hopper will fall because we're not constrained in any way. If we have an extremely strict threshold, from the 100th percentile, then we will never fail, but we won't permit the hopper to go anywhere, so we get very poor reward. But if we pick a medium threshold, then the hopper actually safely hops to its destination and actually gets a higher reward. And you can see that for the blue curve for the LDM, the uh, region where it stays very safe, that's about half the thresholds. That's from the 50th percentile on up. Uh, and right at the 50th percentile, it also gets very high reward. So if you pick the right threshold, you get really great reward. If you're a little careless, then it becomes a little too safe. Um, but it still doesn't fail. And we've evaluated this method on several other tasks. So we evaluated the hopper. We also have a lunar lander task where the goal is to land at a particular location without crashing. And we also have a, um, a, a glucose uh, uh, simulator. This is uh, basically a, a, um, a insulin pump that's uh, adjusting levels of insulin based on glucose levels. Uh, so in all these cases, we're comparing these four methods. And these bar graphs show basically two conditions. The top one is the average return for the best, best threshold for each method. And this is arguably the maximally generous to the prior approaches because they tend to be more sensitive to threshold. And then the bottom is when we average over the thresholds. Then in both conditions, you can see that the LDM does quite a lot better across all of the tasks. So key takeaways. The output of density models which are trained via offline RL from prior data, can provide safety constraints that keep downstream controllers inside the data distribution. And in the same way that the of stability implies never exceeding a distance to the stationary point, the LDM implies never dropping below a desired density level. And this can provide in-distribution safety to downstream model-based uh, controllers, uh, as well as other kinds of learned uh, policies, controllers, models, etc. Okay. So I talked about task agnostic methods for safety, but next let me talk, talk about some task-specific methods. So I'll start with a big question. If you're going to use offline RL and you're going to train a policy for a particular task, why is it not sufficient to just train on prior data? Why do you actually want to do some online adaptation? Well, you can take a Bayesian perspective on this. You can say, what we learn via offline RL is a posterior from a given data set, like, a for example, a probability over optimal policies given the data set. And for a finite size data set, we're going to have uncertainty. We might know, not know exactly what the optimal policy is if our data set is finite in size. So if your uncertainty is high, then it makes sense that you'd want to take this posterior and then explore and adapt online to resolve any remaining uncertainty. So when exploring online, the thing that you should try to do is attempt potentially optimal strategies, and among the potentially optimal strategies, pick the one that turns out to be the best. A very important concept for this is something called the epistemic POM DP. So if you want to find out about the original formulation of the epistemic POM DP, uh, we presented this in a paper in NERVS 2021 called Why Generalization RL is Difficult. Here's the idea. If you have data, all of that data comes from some true MDP. 
right? An MDP consists of states, actions, dynamics, rewards, and discount. But a given finite size data set might be compatible with many possible MDPs. Basically, there are many possible MDPs that could have produced the same data set, which means that you have a distribution over MDPs induced by your data set. So in that situation, the optimal thing to do is to formulate a Bayesian objective, where the way that you maximize reward is you find a policy that maximizes the expected value of the reward under the distribution of MDPs induced by your data. So if you had essentially infinite ability to model things, you would actually learn this, train this distribution P of M given D, and then you would simulate distributions over MDPs and find the policy that achieves maximum reward in expectation of that distribution. So as a generative process, you can think of it as the following, that you have some initial state, and at the first time step, you randomly select an MDP from P of M given D. Basically, you randomly select from among the MDPs that are likely under your data, and then you act in that MDP. And what you want to do is maximize your performance on average across these. Now, the thing is, this is a partially observed MDP, because when you're in a particular M1 or M2 or M3, inside that trajectory, you don't actually know which M was sampled. But it, whatever M, M was sampled stays the same over the course of that trajectory, making this a pump DP. So the M that you sample from P of M given D is unobserved. So that's very important. Essentially, the epistemic uncertainty, the fact that you don't know which MDP you're in, induces partial observability. And that's what we call the epistemic pump DP. Now, this might suggest a Bayes optimal strategy in the offline RL setting. Learn P of M given D, and then solve the induced epistemic pump DP to get pi, and then run pi online. Now, the problem is that the optimal PolyDP solution in general is a memory-based strategy. And roughly speaking, it contains an adaptation procedure inside of it. So if you were to actually find the optimal pi in that PolyDP, that optimal pi would look at memory. And by looking at memory, it essentially becomes adaptive. So it actually contains a little RL procedure inside of it. So pi itself becomes an adaptive learning procedure. And that just emerges automatically from solving the PolyDP. Now, that's a very simplistic view. So in practice, we don't actually want to do this. Why? Well, solving PMDPs in general, much less from offline data, is very hard. And furthermore, we don't know P of M given D. So actually estimating P of M given D from data is harder than the general model-based RL problem. So if your states, for example, consist of images, this is like a really difficult stochastic video prediction problem. So we don't want to have to solve that problem either. So it would be very nice to apply these insights without having to represent the full MDP posterior and without having to solve an arbitrary PMDP problem. Okay, so let's think about how we can do this. The first idea is that the epistemic PMDP has some special structure. It's not an arbitrary PMDP. In fact, it's an instance of something called a Bayes adaptive uh, uh, MDP. So for this first step, solve the epistemic PMDP to get pi, we can actually use a special structure to restrict the form of the policy. So we don't need arbitrary memory dependent policies. We only need to track the posterior belief over the MDP. So at every time step, we need to estimate P of M given the union of the offline data set and the online data set. And just for simplicity, I'm going to assume that the online data set consists of a single trajectory. It's easy to extend this to multiple trajectories, but this will just keep the terminology simple. So it's just the union of D and all the time steps we've seen so far from zero to a little t. And we're going to say that this posterior belief is represented by some vector of parameters b. And that vector of parameters is going to be updated every time step as you observe more and more transitions online. So this is your MDP belief state. We can actually show that the optimal PMDP policy is Markovian given this belief state. So if you give it the observed state and bt, then everything becomes Markovian. So now we just need to do two things. We need to represent and estimate BT, and we need to train the policy so that it's conditioned on ST and BT, and it should be optimal for all possible BTs. So for that second step, it's actually not that hard to do. We're going to just use offline RL, and Every iteration, we're going to sample random BTs. So if BT is represented as a vector of numbers, we'll just sample random values for those numbers, and we'll train pi so that it's optimal for any belief. But the first step, representing and estimating BT, that's actually a little hard. Like, how do we represent P of M given a whole bunch of data? Well, so this is where we're going to use 
a fairly crude but very simple approximation. The, the second idea is that a posterior over Q functions captures the posterior over MDPs. Basically, the MDPs might differ in lots of ways. They might have different dynamics, different initial states. But if in the end, all you care about is the policy, then the only variability across MDPs that matters to you is the differences in the Q functions that are optimal for those MDPs. So if you can get a posterior over Q functions, that's actually all you need to know about the distribution over MDPs. So two, different, two MDPs are different in a relevant way only if they lead to different Q functions. So formally, what that means that is that if BT is sufficient to capture P of Q given your data, that's actually all you need. So now we just need two things, represent P of Q given D and update that belief each time step to get P of Q given the union of the offline data and the online data. So now we're going to make some design choices. And there are many design choices we could make, but the simplest one is to represent the distribution over Q functions given the data with a bootstrapped ensemble of Q functions. This is a fairly standard trick in the literature. Uh, as far as I know, the earliest work to show this was the bootstrap DQN paper, but there may have been many others. So it's a fairly standard trick. Just train multiple Q functions independently, and they will uh, be an unbiased representation of your posterior. Perhaps a crude representation, right? Because you're representing a complicated distribution with a mixture of Dirac delta functions. But it is a valid approximation, and if you have infinitely many models in your ensemble, then you'll get an arbitrarily good approximation. So essentially, P of Q given D is estimated with a mixture of Dirac delta functions, each one centered at uh, one of these independently trained Q functions, QR. And the way that we're going to update our belief at every time step is we're actually going to put weights on these uh, ensemble elements. So in a standard bootstrap ensemble, every element has, has an equal weight of 1 over n. Now we're going to put a different weight, wit. The weights are going to be the parameters of our belief, and we're going to update those weights every time step. So basically, bt is just w1t, w2t, etc., 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 up to wnt. So if we have, let's say, 16 models in our ensemble, bt is just a vector of 16 numbers. Now that's very convenient. We've taken a very complex probabilistic modeling problem and simplified it to something where we need to keep track of just 16 numbers. Now, there are a few details we have to keep in mind. First, the Q function also depends on BT, right? Because the policy depends on BT. And since this is the Q function for a particular policy, the Q function also depends on BT. So when we update the Q function, we have to give it uh, B as an input. And the B changes over time. So during offline training, the Q function depends on B and B changes at each time step. So to train this, we're going to pick the current B randomly for every update. And then we're going to pick B prime by updating according to belief dynamics. Now the belief B has belief dynamics, and that's just the standard base filtering equation. So B prime is just proportional to B times the probability of the observed transition given QI. But there's still a design choice we have to make as to what that probability is. Uh, so essentially we have to design some kind of pseudo likelihood to use for this. And a very natural choice is to just make it proportional to the exponentiated Bellman error. So basically, if you observe a transition that is very, very consistent with a given Q function, then you keep the weight on that Q function high, and if it's very inconsistent, then you lower that weight. But this is a design choice. So we're going to use the Bellman error as a pseudo likelihood, but that's not the only choice we can make. But now that we've made these choices, now we actually have a complete algorithm. We call this um, adaptive policies via ensembles of value functions, or APV. Uh, and it's essentially an offline Q-learning method, or an offline actor critic method more generally, uh, where we train an ensemble of Q functions, and every iteration of value estimation we just sample a random belief for the current time step and compute the next belief according to those uh, uh, pseudo likelihoods. And then we just minimize square and Bellman error. And then the policy just takes B as input. All right, so let's look at some results for this method. We can run it on standard offline RL benchmark tasks, and it does fairly well. So these are the locomotion tasks. And perhaps the most relevant prior method to compare to here is SACN, which is essentially a fancy ensemble method. All of these methods are non-adaptive, so APV is the only adaptive method in this mix. And it's natural to compare it to another ensemble method because, well, uh, it's like an ensemble method, only now it's adapting the ensemble weights online. You can see that adapting those weights online improves performance on four out of the five tasks here. Uh, in fact, we can actually plot the performance of all the models in the ensemble. So the, uh, the dotted orange line is the average performance of the ensemble, and the different blue uh, error bars, those show the different ensemble elements. So you can see that 
they're sorted from best to worst, and there's a range of values. If you use the adaptive strategy, you actually get a better value than any single ensemble member by itself. So not only is this better than averaging over the ensemble, it's actually better than if you were to statically choose a single ensemble element. So that's quite nice. Now, the standard offline RL benchmark tasks don't really emphasize epistemic uncertainty. So we constructed another task that is specifically meant to accentuate epistemic uncertainty. So in this task, the agent observes an image uh, from, from CIFAR-10. And it's supposed to look at this image and then go to one of four doors, which correspond to different labels. So if it sees a boat, it goes to the boat door. If it sees a truck, it goes to the truck door. If it sees a car, it goes to the car door. But the images that it sees at test time are test images. So in general, it has uncertainty about which image it's seeing. So the optimal strategy should be adaptive. If it sees a picture and it thinks it might be an airplane, it should try the airplane door first, but if that door doesn't open, then it knows that it's not an airplane. So it should adapt and go somewhere else. So even though it's kind of an image classification task in disguise, it's actually a sequential process. And the fact that a door isn't open gives you more information about what that image contains. So now this task emphasizes epistemic uncertainty a lot more. And here we see a very substantial improvement, the blue line, uh, from using the adaptive strategy as compared to, for example, uh, an average over the ensemble, which is the orange line, or the green line, which is a more classic pessimistic strategy. Another place where we can use these adaptive strategies is tasks that really emphasize generalization. So here we ran the method on proc gen mazes, where you have new mazes at test time. And again, we see a pretty substantial increase for the adaptive method shown in blue as compared to either a conservative ensemble or no ensemble at all. Okay, so the takeaways, training on offline data implicitly induces partial observability, which provides for a principled motivation for online adaptation after offline training. And we can represent a posterior over Q functions with an ensemble and condition the policy on the posterior belief over the underlying MDP distribution. And something that would be pretty interesting to look at in the future is to improve on this recipe by developing better methods for representing the posterior and better methods for adapting it. So this ensemble method is perhaps one of the crudest ways to represent these posteriors, and the method could conceivably do a lot better if those are improved. So to summarize, I talked about how we could use offline data to improve safety by staying in distribution, either in a task agnostic way or in a task specific way. I'd like to acknowledge the students that uh, carried out this research, particularly Katie Kang, who led the research on LDMs, and Dibba Ghosh, who led the work on APV. Thank you all for listening.